chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized. He left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came back. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Thanks, Trina. <coughs> hey, top of the morning. The, uh, what is it called? The, the spring forward morning. You guys are like the elite, the elite morning people. So, if you've not been with us for a few weeks, happy third week of Lent, and I've still been trying to figure out, like, is that even an appropriate word structure, sentence structure, like, do happy and Lent go in the same sentence? But I think they do. I think that's becoming my experience, and if you're someone going, like, Lent, am I at Mass? The answer is no, but quite frankly, we are in this season where we're just leaning into these more ancient uh, forms of Christian history and, and ways of being church. We recognize that something like Lent isn't in the text, and so if that's something that bugs you, we just have to totally acknowledge that. And yet at the same time, it has for hundreds and hundreds of years been this key re- rhythm for, uh, for many, many Christians. So some of you are practicing and observing in different ways, and I, I hope that's proving fruitful. Others of you not, that's okay. But just by way of quick introduction, I, I, would, I guess I just want to point out that, that Lent, 
It, it's, it's this 40 days, uh, often the words penitent is attached to the description of Lent, which means it's this 40 day season where uh, we're, we're, we're designed to get really introspective and to pay attention to our own brokenness, our own sickness. And it's, the design is that it leads us up to Easter Sunday in order not only for a preparation, but for a celebration. That, that part of what we get to celebrate is spring is coming. And that's not just in the seasonal sense, though that might actually be particularly meaningful this Easter, but also that resurrection has happened and that there is evidence of this new world breaking in and that we get to be a part of that. And so there's these 40 days of Lent and then there's these 50 days of Easter, uh, sometimes called Eastertide, and we're gonna explore that. We've actually put together as a staff a, a calendar with some challenges for you, and also like here's some stuff we can do together if you're interested, to just, the, the idea being that it, you take 40 days to get ready for Easter, but then you don't dare think that you can celebrate it over one ham on Sunday afternoon that it takes a much longer amount of time. And so we, we learn new things and we do things that we otherwise wouldn't do and we generally kind of celebrate and party for 50, 50 days because of the implications of it. Part of it too, I think, for, for me has been worthwhile pointing out that, like, that the flow of, of doing things in a concentrated amount of time, it's very human. Like there's lots of things that we do that we can't sustain them, we can't do them every day, we can't do them every week, we can't do them every month, uh, but, but we do them in this concentrated amount of time in order to have that carry us. I mean, I would argue that's, that's what a date night with your spouse is all about. Life is busy, you often are two ships passing in the night, you, especially, and it doesn't matter what season, different seasons are busy in different ways. The design of a date night is that there's, there's this relational intentionality and the hope is that then that carries through and for another week or two. That's, that's what family vacation's all about. It's what hanging out with friends is all about. Maybe you're someone who signed up for a race this summer, whether on your feet or on two wheels. There's this thing that happens where to get ready for them, uh, we, we, we do something in this concentrated amount of time that we can't possibly do 365 days a year, or at least even if we could, we wouldn't but we use this season to get ready for something. Think about baseball and spring training, football and training camp. I, I noticed this last week, like there was a dip in the attendance at the gym, which was actually really nice. Somewhere like mid-February, like finally the numbers were going down. And then I, I think it must be the weather and the fact that people are like, oh no, I'm signed up for Don't Fence Me In or I'm signed up for the Butte 50 or whatever and I can't do anything outside and there's this like new rise. Why? Because we're, we're getting ready for something and we have this season where we're gonna do that and then life is gonna return to a different kind of rhythm. In my mind, that's, that's Lent. It's giving extra special attention in ways that maybe life doesn't allow or we don't allow it to allow the rest of the year. So we started the first week and if you thought Lent was weird, it doesn't help when we start on Ash Wednesday because on Ash Wednesday, we do this thing that could be perceived as very morbid where another human uh, looks you in the eyes and says, hey, you're gonna die. If you think about it, we don't, we don't do that. And, and especially in the West, we're, we're, like, we, we ship away all death as far as we can get it from ourselves. But part of the design of Ash Wednesday is this kind of stark reminder that that even though it feels like Groundhog's Day sometime, that, that life is cruising to an end. And that as the Apostle Paul said in, in Corinthians, like, like that everybody's gonna receive recompense for what they did in the body, whether good or evil. And so the design of Ash Wednesday is just to get close to this idea, and we explored a little bit more that first Sunday of, of Lent, this idea of, like, we are accountable. And one of the tricky things about becoming the adult, and especially the parent, and the boss, the old person like me and maybe you, is you, you get further and further and further away from any sense of being under authority. Like if you're, if you're a student living in your parents' house still, you, you feel it in some ways more than others, but for most of us, it's just easy to go through life forgetting that, that we are accountable. And Lent is designed to go like, no, you are. And then last week, I agree with Justin, I thought Lexi did a fabulous job of just pointing to this God who wants to take us on adventure and the fact that if we're not careful as we get older, we just, we just play it more and more safe. We, want, we seek security more and more. And that Lent is designed to, to remind ourselves, and we're gonna explore this a little bit next week, like this God loves faith. And he loves action that flows from that type of risk. I think this week, as best I can tell, I think one of the major themes is this idea of communication. 
In fact, I, I think it asks this question, next slide, like, can God communicate with his people? And maybe part of the value of Lent is also to, to go back to the very basic thing of, of hearing from God and doing what he says, and yet it's really tricky, because communication's tricky. In fact, I was reminded, uh, yesterday I was reminded of this story. So my friend Vern, who I've referenced recently, he, he was just, went through some weird stuff because he's no longer leading at a church in Billings, and so that was traumatic for me, but not to make it about me. Anyway, I had this memory of this, this moment in my early 20s when we were, we just planted this church called Harvest. Vern was the lead guy, but he had done student ministry forever, and he was the best student pastor ever. I mean, it, it, he was just phenomenal at it. So he was passionate about it. So I was 20, and my friend John Switzer was 19. He hired us to start this high school and middle school ministry at this church. He, again, this was in this, the, the, the 2000s when there was a model for youth ministry that was less interrupted by youth sports and just the craziness of life. Wednesdays were still observed. It was really kind of a, a neat, fun time. But So they, they put a lot of money into it, including our salaries. And one of the years, we took a bunch of students we, we, chartered a, uh, or we chartered a bus, and we took them to this conference in Denver, John and I did. Uh, it was called Dare to Share. It was actually taught, the guy who started this organization was a former classmate of Vern's, and, and it, was, it was all about student evangelism, and I look back on it now, and I kind of have mixed opinions about even what we were doing there, but all the same, we took this bus, we went down to this thing called Dare to Share, spent a lot of money, we came back. Of course, that got us on their mailing list, and so the ensuing year, as they were getting ready for uh, their next conference, of course, it's just like now, you end up on their, on their mailing list, and so you start getting this marketing. Well, I'd walked into the office one day, and it was one of those days where you're like, what happened here today? Because I was still in college, so I wasn't there all the time. Well, what had happened was they, we had received a postcard from Dare to Share, and it was very kind of gothic and stark, and on the front of it, it just said, youth ministries are failing. This was their marketing campaign, and you flipped it over, and more or less the message was, you guys all stink at what you're doing, so come to us, and we'll fix all your problems. Well, Vern is, is if nothing else, brazen. He was livid. And so he, he's also funny and sarcastic and direct and all kinds of things that are, make him awesome and get you in a lot of trouble in life. And uh, so he jumped on the computer and he sent an email to the guys at Dare, at Dare to Share. And he said, thank you so much for your postcard. We had no idea how hard it was, so I just wanted to let you know, in light of the fact that our youth ministries are failing, I, I fired both of my youth pastors and we reallocated all those funds to buy new carpet for the, for the sanctuary. <laughs> this is the way Vern rolls. So, of course, like that morning, his phone rang, and it was the guy going like, what, what in the world is going on here? And Vern just let him have it of like, do you have any idea how much work this is? And all you do is greet us with more shame like that. So communication, it's, it's a tough thing. <laughs> Listening is a tough thing. I think that's what this week is about, though, and it took me a while to see the trend even within the lectionary. Uh, it's in this psalm, and then you've got this woman who Jesus is interacting with, and Jesus goes, says to his disciples, like, hey, go get some food, and, and then they come back, and, and they do this thing of like, hey, boss, you should eat, and he's like, I, I already ate, I'm not, full anymore. I'm not hungry anymore, and they're like, what do you mean you, you ate? What are you talking about? And he says something like, uh, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, which again is predicated upon something very basic, but something very difficult, isn't it? Hearing and doing. And then there's this psalm, but I think we first have to ask this question, can God still communicate? Like, does he? I mean, let's just get personal for a moment. Like, does he still communicate? Maybe, maybe we could even just ask this question. Can, can you think of a time in your life uh, where somebody, somebody said something to you and you like, you carry it to this day? I don't mean in the negative, hurtful sense. I mean in the positive sense. Like, maybe it was somebody very predictable, like a parent or a coach or a teacher or or, or a counselor. Uh, maybe, maybe it was something random. I can still think of the sermon that I heard the Sunday before I graduated high school and I wasn't even a Christ follower at the time and it's just one of those, like I can still remember that message as though I was the only one in the room. It was about Exodus 3. Maybe it was a moment like that for you. Uh, maybe it was at a kind of classic moment like a graduation or a wedding ceremony. Maybe even something like a funeral but can you, th can you think of something? See, I think this psalm would have us ask the question, okay, so we know people can do that. 
for better and for worse. But living in the world that we do in the 21st century, can God still do that? Like, does God still do that? Like, we give a lot of attention, even in the faith conversation about God's transcendence, that he's way outside, he's bigger. It was in some of even the music this morning, and I love it, like the transcendence of God. But is he also imminent? Like, is, is, he, is he present? Can he still communicate to people? And if so, how? I mean, some of you might point to the text. We, we assign some, some pretty mystical, but I would, I would agree with it, language to the Bible, like that it's the living word of God. Even Paul uses some of this language. And some of you know the experience of spending time in the text and just having this sense of like, God just spoke to me this morning. I would say not every time I read the Bible does that happen, but it's the fact that that does happen uh, with, with decent frequency, that that's what brings me back every day. Or, or, or prayer. Prayer is this classic form through which God communicates. Uh, solitude, silence. Some of you probably have this experience of like a God who speaks when you're exercising. There's something about like the body being in motion and and God's ability to break through the mind. We also use language, and, and if you're someone that's new to faith and we're so glad you're here, some of this stuff gets so weird because we'll even use language like the still, small voice of God, and we'll go like, what the heck is that? And yet some of you, you have experience and opinion with that. Like you, you, you know that voice. Like, does God still communicate? And what if Lent is on some level about reminding ourselves that he does, uh, that there's potential for that? That within that arrangement of God communicating to people, like he, he has a responsibility and, and so do we. And then there's also these questions. I was just reminded, I actually started uh, studying, working my way through John slowly. I think in September we're just gonna jump into John and, and plow through that and we'll interrupt it unlike Matthew and it'll probably take us decades. But, but I was reminded even at the very end of of, of the prologue to John, uh, John the Apostle says something I think very, very important in, in verse one and as we talk about how God speaks, in verse 18 he says, no one's ever seen God. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who's made him known. There's this brilliant statement from the Orthodox uh, where, where they say God sounds like, or uh, yeah, God sounds like Jesus. And I think part of uh, the litmus test of uh, is God speaking is, well, would Jesus have said it? Like that's the privilege of, one of the major privileges of God becoming human is now all, all of the ethereal and all of the law and all of the abstract and all of the written word, it becomes a person. And I think that's why we have such a responsibility to spend time in the gospels because sometimes you hear from God and maybe this is where you're still like uh, on the outside of faith. Sometimes we hear from God and we're like, well, they said they heard from God and they killed people. So how am I supposed to trust that I heard from God when he said to do this? And part of that is, well, the son Jesus is really important to that whole conversation. I just finished up C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles, which quite frankly is, I think now, a top five book. It's one of those books for me that I've tried to read several times and the first few chapters are so hard that I quit. But if you just plow through and pretend like you understand the first third of the book, it really starts to make sense. But one of the things that he says in the opening page is the thing about miracles is if you, if you don't believe they're possible, you'll never see one. Which, as a cynic of faith, you could go, well, that, well, yeah, that's convenient. But he would say the reverse is also true. Like, like, if you believe in them, you might see them, and if you don't, you won't. And I wonder if that same dynamic doesn't work when it comes to hearing from God. And maybe for you in your journey, maybe you don't identify with the intensity of faith that others in the room do, but maybe for you, it's a dare that you give to God this morning. Like, okay, so they say you communicate to people. Bring it. Like, let, let's hear it. Probably not audibly. Give God a timeline. You know, till next Sunday at 9 a.m., does God do that? And the trick is, if you've already concluded he doesn't, then he, dare I say, can't. Or at least it's not likely that you'll hear it if he does. But for the rest of us, I think one of the real dangers, and this is why we all have different opinions about different forms of liturgy and religion and Christianity, is there, there's, this, there's this danger that in the midst of all the other stuff we do, 
whether that's volunteering with Lexi or showing up early or playing in the band or giving financially, like all the stuff we do in the name of Jesus, we, we can do all of that and miss this one really vital thing, which is, is the with us God who, who wants to communicate and requests that you follow. And I think that's what Psalm 95 is really getting into. Now, next slide. I think Psalm 95 is a collect. And if you don't come from historical kind of liturgical background, you may be like, a what? A collect is, it's a word assigned now in a lot of older forms of church, but, but it's also very prevalent within the text itself. And it's this way, I'm, I'm kind of studying them right now because I'm intrigued by this idea that sometimes we get really caught off guard in prayer because it's like, why do I tell God that's something he already knows and how do I find the balance between too many words which Jesus warns us about but also not doing it with enough frequency? And a collect is this form of prayer. There's hundreds of them in the Bible and hundreds of them written outside of the Bible where it's a really simple formula where first of all, you remind God about who he is. There's some aspect of his character, his person, that you remind God about which I know sounds weird, but it's like, hey God, remember you're merciful, please forgive me. That's basically the pattern. You remind something about his, his, his character and then you make this request. And I think Psalm 95 is this weird, kind of inverted, surprise you, but also pretty neat collect. Let's, let's just jump back into verse one. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. We're actually on April 30th gonna do this. We're gonna just dedicate the whole morning to this question of like, why do we sing and just w- w- more, more, more music, less talk, but we just kinda wanna explore like, what is this thing we're doing together right now through the word and music and I think that'll be fun. But that's what this is a call to is this corporate worship. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods, In his hands are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. Now remember, in this culture, there was no such thing as an atheist. So what's unique here is is that they're saying all this stuff that many other cultures would need multiple gods to assign to, it all belongs to this one God. O come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. So there's the collect, there, there's the beginning praise. There's this like, okay God, I mean it's kinda like you, you with your parents maybe, maybe you do this now, maybe you can remember where there's like, okay I'm gonna remind you of all these things and then I'm gonna make an ask. Kind of a smart way to roll. And here's the request. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. So as best I can understand, and I can't claim to be a scholar of the Psalms, what's unique about this Psalm is that it does something surprising. Because in the end, there is a request, but it's not being made of, of a person to God. It's God making a request to people. There's this thing that's flipped. And then he tells this weird, uncomfortable story. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, at, at, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof. And then watch these last lines. Though they had seen my work. What's going on here? Well, can you think of a story from your own past that's like your most morally abhorrent moment ever? Can you think of one? One of your most embarrassing, one of the things you need to forgive him for, one that maybe you're still paying the cost of, the consequences from. Can you think of a story like that? Okay, now let's turn and tell your neighbor your story. <laughs> that's an uncomfortable laugh. I'm kidding. But that, that's what this psalm does. Like, there's this really embarrassing story from Israel's past. It involves, first of all, God sent Moses to rescue them from Egypt, and Moses and God did these ten miracles, these ten plagues, and defeated all these Egyptian gods, and the people watched it all. It's like, what's the new episode that's going to drop tonight? and they just watched the whole thing unfold. God finally let them out of Egypt. They left with a lot of the Egyptians' finest materials and wealth. They marched out of town. They had this very concrete pillar of cloud and fire that they followed. Things were going great. They got several days in. Pharaoh changed his mind. He started chasing them down. Suddenly they're trapped. They've got Pharaoh's army on one side and the Red Sea on the other, and they're kind of freaking out. God parts the Red Sea. They walk through it. The Egyptians try to follow. 
It, it closes, they drowned, they're on the other side of the Red Sea, they're marching into the promised land, and then they get thirsty. And there's this question of like, why does this story keep coming up over and over and over? They get thirsty and they start freaking out. Now, I, personally, I, I've realized in looking at this, I gotta be careful to not be too hard on them for thirst because I've never been that vulnerable or thirsty. I mean, my idea of dying of thirst is I'm on a run and my water bottle's empty. These are people without plumbing and without anything else in the desert, and I've been in that desert a couple times, and I would say it's the hottest I've ever been in my life, and it, it's remarkable. We would carry these fanny packs on this study tour that I was on, and they had these two 20-ounce bottles, and then when we were in this region, not quite this far south, but in the southernmost part of, of Israel, then we would strap this one-and-a-half liter bottles to the bottom half, and we'd be out of the bus for three or four hours at the most, and when we got back to the bus, nobody had water left. So I think on the one hand, we've got to be a little bit compassionate and recognize uh, that it's easy to just hammer on them, but there's something going on here. And they cry out to God for thirst. But here's, to me, the weird thing. It's a very embarrassing story, and it's a story the Old Testament loves to tell. It's in Exodus, it's in Numbers, it's in Deuteronomy, it's in Psalm 95. Hebrews brings it up in both chapter 3 and chapter 4. It's like, this, it's, it's like that, like here's this morally abhorrent thing you did to somebody at some point and you're so embarrassed by it and you're like, I'm not telling that story. And God keeps telling the story. But why? What's the issue there? And that's where I think the, the center point, we can just go to that next slide of this, is like, oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Probably nothing new for anybody in the room, but just this reminder. I mean, as you know, I, I like baseball, and it's spring training, and theoretically tryouts start in our own town here in the next week, which is kind of comical. The best they're going to do is work out with all of the manure inside the fairgrounds, where they'll maybe do inside tryouts. But part of baseball is, is hitting off of a tee. I heard it said one time that there's nobody who plays in Major League Baseball who doesn't hit off a tee 100 times a day. And yet, you go like, wait, wait a minute, my three-year-old grandson hits off of a tee. It's this very rudimentary, very fundamental thing, but if you can't do that, you can't do anything else at the plate. And I wonder if week three of Lent, 2023, can kind of serve that purpose for us. Like, something as simple as hearing God's voice and doing what he says. And that can spring off into a lot of different directions. A, like, are you creating the space to give him a chance to do that? B, are, are, are you being that, that son or daughter that Jesus tells parables about that's willing to listen and then rarely ever actually does it? There's lots of different ways this could go. Maybe there's something even right now personal for you of like, yeah, 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 God's been talking to me about that. Yep, thanks for bringing it up. What if it's that simple? You know, I was listening to this spiritual director <coughs> about a year ago uh, it was a podcast. He was actually an Orthodox guy, too, is actually, and, and he asked this question. He, he said, I like to ask people, how many times a day do you check in with Jesus? Never th even thought of that. And then he says, I think the goal's 100. And I was like, gulp? I, I'm shooting for once a week. Do lots of things in his name. Do lots of kind of Christian gymnastics, but the actual, like, checking in with is God that personal? Is he that close? And can it be everything as trivial as like drive this different path today to something as massive as end this relationship or start this discipline or whatever that looks like? What if, what if week three of Lent in this season of intensity is, is like hitting the ball off of a tee? We can drift a long ways from this, but if we get too far from it, our sophistication will actually be our undoing. So what we want to do this morning as the band comes back up here is just create some space for you of just like, okay, so in what ways might God want to evaluate with you on what does it look like to, to make space for him? We're going to turn that into one of the memory verse cards that we provide. We don't have it yet, but just that, just love that refrain. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. And I think it's also this reminder that Part of why we do this thing called communion is, is to get really upfront and personal with a God who's present. 
And, and the design of this time, if you're a guest with us this morning, is you don't have to take communion. You're welcome to, to the extent that you're actively following Jesus. We'd love for you to do that. If you've not been baptized, we'd love to have that conversation, but you can have communion this morning. There'll be bread over here and wine over here. And, and, and the purpose of this is, first of all, to just spend a little bit of time going like, okay, so what's the stuff that God might want to talk to you about? And the design is, is not just to do the, the role, of the, the function of confession, but to receive forgiveness, to recognize that it's this moment, this cross, this resurrection, that's why we're not butchering chickens this morning. Because Jesus was the final, the ultimate. So as the band is gonna lead us in a song, you can grab stuff, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray and then we'll give you a chance to grab communion. God, thanks. Um, thanks for who you are and what you're about. Thanks you, that you are both transcendent and imminent. Thanks that you do speak to us. And God, I pray for people here this morning who just, quite honestly, they have absolutely no experience of that. Uh, and yet I would suggest that their being here um, marks them at least as intrigued. And I trust you know them better than we do and you love them more than any of us else do, that you would just continue to steward what it is you're doing in them. And then, God, I pray for people in the room who do identify as yours, uh, that we wouldn't in our own theological and Christian sophistication and busyness of life drift from this idea that you're a God who, who wants to guide and direct and lead. And oftentimes your direction is do what you want, and every once in a while, it's a lot more specific than that. And then, God, we just pray for this uh, chance to, to receive the bread and the wine and recognize that the function of what it means to be yours is you take our ordinary, everyday lives and infuse them with your spirit so that we can go be you in our community, and we would ask that you take this ordinary, everyday bread and wine and send your spirit and make it food for us as we try to follow you. We love you. Amen. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us online at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook or Instagram.